Welcome back to Hunky Vape. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape 5 on Friday Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the 15th of January, 2021. On the news today, South Fulton, Georgia bans vaping and smoking in public places. Missoula, Montana eyes reversal on its flavored vape ban. Biden picks FDA veteran Janet Woodstock as acting FDA commissioner. Is this going to be a good thing or a bad thing for the vaping industry? Next, we'll expose a 73-year-old senator's agenda and the financial conflict of interests that are served by her agenda. Yep, benefits big tobacco giants, big pharma giants, and NGOs like the American Lung Association and the American Heart Association. Then moving on to international vape news. The Netherlands announced a ban on all cigarette flavors, electronic cigarette flavors, except tobacco, of course. And they're doing this in the name of youth smoking prevention. We all know what the scientists are going to say about the consequences of this reckless prohibitionist regulation. Removing flavors will not affect the rates of youth cigarette use, but it certainly will keep people smoking and even increase the number of adults who switch back to deadly combustible cigarettes. For a bit of good news, we move down to New Zealand and see Vapo has opened its 16th store in Ponsonby and will soon be opening a 17th store in Dunedin. You know, their stores remind me of the Ponsonby's in GTA or the Vapid Motor Company in GTA. And like if they got together and decided they were going to make a vaping product, like their logo would be like high priced mass production at its finest. You know, it was almost a year and a half ago, the Vapo set its sights on the premium market in the UK. And looking at their website, I was hoping to find some nice premium products. Maybe something I could try out. Maybe something I could review. Yeah, well, the only thing on their website is the Hayes Lanyard Pod. How the hell is a five pound pod considered a premium product? Anyway, jumping across the Tasmanian Sea for our commentary segment, we'll take a look at Australia's global university in Sydney. The University of South Wales School of Public Health and Community Medicine. Yep. Yeah. We'll take a look at an associate professor, Dr. Colin Mendelson's published article titled Nicotine vaping should be legal. Nicotine has changed quite a bit since the original publication of this article in the Sydney Morning Herald, August of 2016, back when it was still just listed as a plain ordinary Schedule 7 drug. But does it really still belong as a Schedule 4 pharmacist only dispense medicine with a prescription? We'll talk about that and how it's still listed as a Schedule 7 dangerous poison and it's listed as a Schedule 6 poison and obviously a Schedule 4 prescription drug. Well, except if it's in tobacco. You see, if you have tobacco, you can spray as much nicotine on it as you want and then it's perfectly safe for public health because it doesn't apply to tobacco. You know, and since we're talking about public health, we can't leave any stone unturned. So the World Health Organization must be called out for not helping people quit smoking. 1.1 billion tobacco users need help to stop. But the World Health Organization's unambitious aim is set to only help 100 million smokers. Yeah. That's kind of like handing out five boxes of condoms to stop the AIDS epidemic. We're kind of like Greg Hunt sending out a single court jester that he borrowed from the UK with a case of vaccines to achieve herd immunity for the whole country. I wonder if he got his idea from Boris Johnson's statement to the Italian Prime Minister in March of last year. Regardless, one thing is for certain. 
The World Health Organization is far more interested in ending tobacco harm reduction products than in saving lives. Which leads us to our science segment. Dr. Chuck Dinnerstein publishes Truth Butter titled, Vaping Reduces Inflammatory Biomarkers Compared to Smoking. And he did this to refute the research letter published in the American Heart Association's journal, Circulation. I'll spare you the scientific jargon. It boils down to e-cigarettes reduce harm. And instead of demanding smokers totally eliminate harm, people must face up to a simple fact. Perfection is the enemy of good. 1.1 billion tobacco users need harm reduction, not perfect abstinence. And the highlighted advocacy group for today is CASA. No, not that CASA, the other one. Campaign for safer alternatives. Ain't nothing to it but to get into it. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, here we are today taking a look at the city of South Fulton, South Fulton in Georgia, because they decided that they need to protect people. They needed to ban smoking and vaping to protect people from secondhand smoke. There is no smoke coming out of vape devices. This? is aerosolized vegetable glycerin. It is not smoke. However, they don't know that, or if they do, they don't care, because they lump it all together. And they decided, the city council decided that, you know, since the state doesn't have a law about this, we need to make one. You know, so they decided that they're gonna ban all smoking and vaping in public places. They're not the first one to come up with this idea, and they're certainly not going to be the last. However, jumping over to Montana, we reported about this. Missoula, Montana, not only banned flavors and vaping in their city, but because of their unusual laws, they banned it five miles outside of their city. Well, right now, they're eyeing the reversal of the flavor ban. You know, if they got high often enough, you know, they could just keep flip-flopping this back and forth. However, it is a good thing that they're considering reversing this ridiculous flavor ban. Because all the flavor bans ever do is drive people back to smoking cigarettes. So let's take a look at the Biden administration's pick for the FDA. Well, this article comes from Vaping 360, and they pick veteran Janet Woodcock as the acting commissioner. And let me tell you, she's a lot better than the top two people that were on the list to take the job full time. And if Biden knows what's good for him, he should make her not just the temporary acting commissioner should set her into the seat and have her do the job that needs to be done. Let's take a look at this article here. And uh, American Vaping Association President Greg Conley tweeted, no Biden pick, FDA pick, is going to magically reform the broken PMTA process. But at least, but Woodcock is at least an institutionalist who will likely respect the autonomy of different, different divisions. And she's a better pick for the permanent slot than somebody from Bloomberg land. Yeah, remember how I talked about better than the two semifinalists? David Kessler? Yeah, he was one of them. 
Well, you can take a look at the article for yourself if you want to know more about Biden's pick for the FDA. However, I think it's time that we call out 93-year-old U.S. Senator from New Hampshire for her shenanigans regarding electronic cigarettes and her agenda to tackle the youth vaping crisis that doesn't exist. You see, during a global pandemic, schools are operating in a different fashion than normal. So how can there possibly be a youth vaping epidemic right now when kids are at home with their parents and they're doing remote schooling, they're not even in the school. And if they are in the school, they're only in the school half time. And they have to be scheduled to stay with the same group of people to minimize the chance of a COVID infection spreading in the school and in the district. So, if there's still a youth vaping epidemic, then it's because the parents are giving the vapes to the kids. Where else are they getting it from if they're home with the parents? However, that hasn't stopped this senator, and she's prioritized efforts in the Senate to tackle this youth vaping crisis. She's repeatedly pressed Trump administration to remove flavored electronic cigarettes from the market. Remember that? Yeah? Stop delaying action in implementing the planned restrictions on flavored products and hold electronic cigarette companies accountable. Yeah, you're going to love this one. She led a bipartisan group of senators in introducing the Resources to Prevent Youth Vaping Act which is going to require electronic cigarette manufacturers pay user fees to the FDA to help fund more activity at the agency to conduct stronger oversight of the electronic cigarette industry and increase awareness on the danger of electronic cigarettes. I think Senator Shaheen needs to learn what the dangers are she's talking about because they don't exist. I love how these politicians just blow things way out of proportion. And the thing is, most people are too lazy to look into it to find out the truth for themselves. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at this bipartisan group of senators that she's got working with them, and let's see who she's in bed with, okay? Because you're going to love this one, all right? Let's take a look. What, what else is she doing? Oh, yeah, she's had multiple meetings with students, educators, law enforcement, and health office, health officials across the state about the ongoing health concerns. What health concerns? Focus on the pandemic. We need to get the vaccination done so that we can move on to somewhat normal lives again instead of being constantly locked up. They're so out of touch with reality, it's just ridiculous. No tax subsidies for Electronic Cigarette and Tobacco Ads Act, closing a loophole that allows manufacturers to claim federal tax deductions for the cost of advertising. What advertising? It's been banned. So how are you going to collect taxes on something that's been banned? Shaheen is a supporter of Electronic Cigarette Devices Standards Act. You know what that means? She wants to get rid of open tank systems and go to sealed pod systems that add to the materials that don't go into the recycling and end up in landfills. And she's doing that to keep THC cartridge contents from entering open tank systems. Okay, that's not going to work either. There's these things called drill bits. So even if you had this law in place and everything was, you know, fully implemented, you don't think somebody knows how to use a drill bit to drill into those cartridges and fill it up with whatever they wanted to fill it up with? Mm. Let's
let's just take a look back what she was doing January of last year and who she was in bed with, okay? Yep. Senators Jean Shaheen, Lisa Murkowski, Richard Durbin, Mitt Romney, Tammy Baldwin, and Susan Collins from Maine introduced bipartisan legislation to protect children from the dangers of electronic cigarettes. Electronic cigarettes are not cigarettes. Stop treating them like they are, because they're not. The Resources to Prevent Youth Vaping Act would require that all cigarette manufacturers pay user fees to the FDA to help, you know, fund them. Teachers and parents are overwhelmed. No, they're not. This bill will create even more regulatory playing and even regulatory playing field by expanding the existing FDA authority to collect user fees on traditional tobacco products to include electronic cigarette products. Yeah. The truth comes out, doesn't it? Yep, here it is. She wants to level the playing field. Because, you know, mom and pop shops sell this kind of stuff, and we need to get rid of the mom and pop shops. We only want big corporations in play here. Because we want to collect all this money that we've been collecting for all these years. We want to eliminate tobacco products, but we don't want to eliminate their income. So we need to transfer that onto something else. And if we eliminate thousands upon thousands of small businesses, that's eh, just the cost of doing business, moving forward in life. Okay, let me remind everybody here of Mitt Romney and how he's such a hypocrite to his Mormon faith because he took over Bain, made millions of money, millions upon millions of dollars, yeah, with big tobacco in Russia. You remember all that? I did a story about that too. No surprise here. No surprise because Michelle Minton from the Competitive Enterprise Institute published on the second of this year, Mitt Romney made millions off of cigarettes. Now he wants to kill its competition. Not a surprise. These are the idiots and this is why they're doing it. This is exactly why they're doing it. Who you think pays for them to get reelected in the office? Everybody says, oh, you know, we have term limits in this country. They're called elections. You mean legalized bribery? That's all elections have become anymore is legalized bribery. See, the donors go out there and pay for all these contributions to the candidates they want in office. And regular old citizens, sorry for your luck. They're going to tell you what you want to hear, and then they're going to do whatever they want when they get in office because nobody reads through 6,000-page-long bills to find out how they got screwed. So let's take a look at this article published from the American Council on Science and Health. Vaping. Does the American Lung Association have a financial conflict of interest? Uh-huh. This guy bought his first electronic cigarette in 2012. And after a month of smoking and using the electronic cigarette, vaping, he finished off his last pack of camels and gave up tobacco forever. And there's thousands upon thousands of Americans who have followed the exact same path to a smoke-free life. And if you ask the American Lung Association through his vaping compatriots. And I must not exist because the anti-tobacco group says electronic cigarettes do not help smokers quit. As Fox Business reported on December 5th, while the e-cigarette industry tells smokers falsely that switching to their products is safer and can help them quit, the American Lung Association is urging the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, which regulates nicotine vaping products, to crack down on these false quit 
smoking claims. I'm one of those claims. I smoked for decades. And vaping was the only thing that empowered me to give up my deadly combustible cigarette habit. But according to American Lung Association, I don't exist. According to the American Lung Association, it's not easier for me to breathe from now compared to when it was when I was smoking. Oh no, I must be lying. Wait a minute, I can't lie if I don't exist. Anyway, don't mean to be a rant. You can take a look at the article for yourself. Vaping. Does the American Lung Association have a financial conflict of interest? Does the American Heart Association have a financial conflict of interest? I bet you can take a look and find out where they donate money and who they donate it to and who provides them with funding. Big circle of life for these NGOs. They're not government organizations. But where's the money come from to fund them? Uh-huh. All right. Let's jump over to some international news. The Dutch. This comes from TobaccoReporter.com. The Dutch urge to ditch planned flavor ban. Recently proposed ban on vaping flavors in the Netherlands will endanger public health. This is according to the Independent European Vape Alliance. We talked about them a couple weeks ago on the news. They were one of the highlighted advocacy groups. Around 65% of adult vapors in Europe use fruit or sweet liquids. And the variety of flavors is the most important reason that smokers have to switch to electronic cigarettes. And for vapors not to relapse and go back to smoking. Dutch State Secretary Paul Bokus announced a ban on all electronic cigarette flavors, except, big surprise, Tobacco flavors, that's okay. We can keep reminding you of your old t- tobacco habit. That's not a problem. But you want a, you know, a cherry pie flavor? No, you're not allowed a cherry pie flavor. Their goal is to remind you how good you had it when you were smoking cigarettes and paying all that tax money to the government. Yeah, you can take a look at this article. Same thing we've seen countless other places. Nova Scotia did the same thing, and look what happened there. Yeah. Number of cigarette users went up. Number of illegal criminals went up because people says, I'm not giving this up. You want me to go back to smoking those death sticks? No. That's what's going on here. So let's go look for some good news. All right, let's jump across the Tasmanian Sea. Let's jump across the pond. Take a look at New Zealand. And take a look at VAPO. VAPO is continuing the fight against the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. As it opens yet another new vape store. The virus outbreak hasn't been the only thing impacting the Kiwi vape market, as New Zealand also witnessed the imposition of tougher vape regulations. Despite that, Vapo opened up its 16th vape store in Ponsonby, following two other stores that were opened in Queenstown and Pukehoe, Puki Kohi last month. And next month, they're going to be opening, or later this month, 
their 17th store in Dunedin. This is owned by New Zealand co-owners Ben Pryor and Jonathan Devery and say that the uh, dedicated stores are critical to the country becoming smoke-free and are a consequence of the tougher vaping regulations brought about by the government this year. In short, their new specialist vape stores will help keep many Kiwis off of cigarettes given the likes of dairies face heavy restrictions on vape flavors from next year. Moving forward. Yep, take a look at the article yourself. It's in Planet of the Vapes. Vapo continues the fight. I talked about in the introduction here. Kiwi Vaping Company, this was um, November of, uh, not last year, the year before. Sets their sights on the premium vaping market, the saturated vaping market in the UK. They uh, started making their move over there. Vapo has grown quickly in New Zealand, but will face a different challenge in the UK, one of the most mature vaping markets in the world, and one of the most saturated vaping markets in the world. The UK market has become saturated with vaping products, particularly, I just said that, particularly those owned by big tobacco companies. Oh, that's so surprising, isn't it? Mason is hoping to set Vapo apart by going after the premium market with a select range of products. Well, that's not what I found when I went to their store in the UK. And I bet it's not for lack of trying on their part, to be honest and to be fair. Because no country makes, you know, establishing yourself as a new business with a product like this easy. You don't have enough financial resources to do all the regulatory requirements. Well, guess you're not going to succeed. All right, let's take a look at an article that was published in the University of New South Wales, Sydney. This was uh, published by Dr. Colin Mendelson. Actually, this article that's here was published four years ago. Yeah, four years ago in the Sydney Morning Herald, talking about how nicotine is a Schedule 7 poison. And for those of you not familiar with how the scheduling works in Australia, um, Schedule 1 is not being used for anything. Schedule 2 is a pharmacy medicine. Schedule three is a pharmacist only medicine, meaning you have to have a compound pharmacist mix it up for you. Schedule four is prescription only medicine or a prescription remedy for an animal. Schedule five is a cautionary listing. Schedule six is a poison. Seven is a dangerous poison. Eight is a controlled drug. Nine is a completely prohibited substance. And 10 is substances of such danger to public health as to warrant complete prohibition of sale, supply, and use. And back when we did the, when he wrote this article four years ago, it was a, it, nicotine was classified as a Schedule 7 dangerous poison in the poison standards. And there's been some hoo ha going on about you know reclassifying it and there's already been multiple things done as far as requiring a prescription to possess nicotine in Australia. However, they finally got around to publishing the updates. So I decided to take a closer look at it and see what the big hubbub was and what did they end up doing with it? Yep. And if you were paying attention, you just caught on to what the, what the whole thing is I'm getting at. If you take a look at the poison standards, and this is not only the one that was done in October, but this is the one that's actually going to be, you know, in effect starting next month. Nicotine is listed as a Schedule 7, a Schedule 6, and a Schedule 4. 
drug. And we'll get to the appendix here shortly, but you take a look at this list, Schedule 7 is a dangerous poison. Well, if it's 1,000 milligrams per milliliter, okay, I can see where you're coming from there. And if it's 500 milligrams per milliliter, then I can see why it would move down to a Schedule 6. But why is it a Schedule 4 requiring a prescription? Oh, that's right. we got to protect the youth from having access to it. Because, you know, youths follow all rules and regulations and laws. None of them are out there drinking underage. They don't do that, do they? However, this is where it sits. And I just thought I'd, you know, dig into a little bit more and see what they do is because everywhere else seems to like have a special like clause that nicotine that's on tobacco, eh, it's okay. Tobacco, you light it up, burn it on fire, breathe it in, perfectly legal. Not a problem. Eh, they raise the minimum age to start using it to 21. But that that's pretty much it, right? Well, Australia's no different. Nicotine, except when in tobacco. There you go. There's your exception. And this regards to their safety. Don't get it in your eyes and don't get it on your skin. Because, you know, it's a transdermal drug and it will absorb through your skin. You don't want to get it in your eyes because obviously it'll do the same thing and it'll burn your eyes. But amazing. Tobacco is like completely safe, high up on a pedestal. Nobody can touch it. It'll be for sale forever. Meanwhile, those of us that gave up our deadly combustible cigarette habit have to fight to be able to keep using a safer alternative, a safer product. That leads us to the World Health Organization. Yeah. From what we know, does the world, world Health Organization doesn't help you quit smoking. From what we know, the answer is yes, they do not help you quit smoking. They have no interest in helping you quit smoking. They say they do, but their actions are actually not what they're saying they're going to do. How do we know that? There's 1.1 billion tobacco users worldwide. And you know what their goal is? Their goal is to help 100 million people give up that habit. And you know how they want you to do it? Using pharmaceutical products. Not something like this that is a user-driven enterprise. Because it works. Pharmaceutical products, they didn't work for me. And they didn't work for a lot of other people I know. This worked for me. And worked for a lot of other people I know. But that doesn't count in their playbook. Well, you can take a look at the article yourself. New Year's resolutions always include commitments to quit smoking. Most people fail not for want of trying, but for want of options that can help them. And our interventions to date are not good enough. Will the World Health Organization's campaign to help 100 million people quit tobacco make a difference? Is the World Health, or World Health Organization willing to embrace new methods and emerging scientific data? That's what they classify the last 10 years worth of data as emerging scientific data. COVID came into existence just over a year and a half ago, but we already know everything there is to know about it. Enough to create a vaccine and get it distributed so that people don't get sick anymore. But something that's been around for 10 years and researched all along the way. It's just emerging scientific data. You need decades of it 
before they'll actually be willing to accept what you have. Well, you can take a look at the article for yourself. But it seems that the World Health Organization is far more interested in ending the use of tobacco harm reduction products than saving lives. That's the sad reality there. All right, let's jump on to our science segment. American Council on Science and Health published this article, and it was published by an MD, a doctor, Chuck Dinnerstein. He says, remember vaping? Remember before COVID-19 took all the oxygen out of the room when vaping was the big fear? Well, a new study shows what we have been claiming all along as being true. Vaping reduces inflammatory biomarkers associated with smoking tobacco. Wow, maybe that's why I can breathe much better ever since I started vaping and gave up my deadly combustible cigarette habit. Who knew? Besides me. Well, I guess now that it's on a piece of paper and been peer-reviewed, oh, wait a minute, that's not what the paper conclusion was. That's why he had to write this article. While vaping inflammatory biomarkers were elevated compared to non-users, those differences were not statistically significant. There was also no significant difference in the elevation of biomarkers between the exclusive smokers and the dual smokers. Meaning, if you were classified as a smoker because you smoked, you got put into a smoker's group. If you did both, smoke and vape, then they put you in a different group. And they took readings and measurements of both, and guess what? They were the same. Meaning, if you smoke, you have damage done, and your biomarkers are elevated. But if you vape only, then you're with the category of the people that just breathe air. If you vape and smoke, your labs, theoretically, if they say vaping is so bad, should be much higher than the people that just smoke. But they weren't. They were the same. Which means there is no additive effect that vaping makes it worse. But that's, you know, math. One plus one would equal two. Unless one plus one wasn't adding one, it was adding zero. So one plus zero is still one. And that's why when you were looking at just vapors to regular people that was a control group that just breathed air, didn't smoke or vape, they were the same pretty close to the same, not statistically different. One more scientific study to prove what we all know. In a perfect world, we would prefer that people completely gave up all association to anything related to tobacco, give up your smoking habit, give up vaping, giving everything. But this is the real world. This is not some ideal world that doesn't exist, some fantasy land. So, in the name of harm reduction, we must accept electronic cigarettes as a safer nicotine product, as tobacco harm reduction. Take a look at the article yourself. American Council on Science and Health promoting science and debunking the junk since 1978. It's a long time. So let's take a look at and jumping into our highlighted advocacy for, group for the week. And I said that it's CASA. And everybody's brain went, oh yeah, CASA, yeah, I know CASA. I, I follow their call to actions all the time. Well, this is a different CASA. This is the campaign for safer alternatives. 
And I know I'm going to lose a bunch of you here. It's a Pan-African NGO member organization. And they're dedicated to achieve 100% smoke-free environments in Africa. Now, if you remember, and if you've been following the news along with me, you'll know they decided in the name of COVID they were going to ban all tobacco. How'd it work? Did it work good? Oh, no, it didn't. The price that people were required to pay to get a pack of cigarettes because they still wanted it. They were still addicted to smoking and nicotine. They, they just went up in price. Five times what they used to cost before they banned it. So there was a thriving black market, but it didn't stop them from smoking. Yeah, well, that's a sad reality anywhere that they decide to ban this stuff. Prohibition doesn't work. Hasn't worked ever. Never will work. It does accomplish things for people, and there's still people that are going to advocate for it, no matter how much science you shove in their face. Because there are people profiting from your misery. That's a fact of life we live in, in a capitalistic society like we have today. And I'm not opposed to, you know, capitalism or business or any of that. But how much is enough? How rich is rich? I personally feel I'm richer because I take my time and I spend it with my family and my friends and promoting things that help people live a better life. I'm not focused on being a greedy bastard, wanting more than what you already have. However, you can take a look at um, the Highlight Advocacy Group for this week. And my apologies, this turned into a big rant news segment today. That wasn't my intention. But it's because I'm passionate about this. Vaping helped me give up a deadly combustible cigarette habit that I wasn't able to give up with any medication, not even multiple medications at the same time. Vaping works. So... Trying to end this on a positive note. Here's my message to you. Go make this world better this year. That's all I ask. Try and make this world a better place to live. Oh. And keep on vaping. Oh. And thanks for watching. Have a great day.